We are live with Dr. Ian Billinghurst, who is in, are you in Sydney, Australia, or just, is that the, is that the city that you refer people to because we, uh, it's, our, it's our greatest point of reference? It's a point of reference because of the time zone. Uh, because, well, most people overseas don't even know, know much about Australia or where it is. And so I say, then they look it up on whatever device they look it up on. And so they work out they're either 10 hours ahead or 10 hours behind or, or whatever. Uh, and that we actually get it right, if I say that. I'm actually two and a half hours from Sydney, down the coast, in a little town called Berry on the south coast of New South Wales. It's dairy farming country. It's absolutely beautiful country. And uh, it's a delight to be here. Because I, if I go to the shops or whatever, I go out and I see dairy cows and, and woodlands and the escarpment with trees is just a beautiful environment and, and of course we're close to the sea so i can go and not swim anymore because uh, i tend to drown these days but um just just go and look at it and walk on the wow. beach beautiful that sounds incredible well thank you because i know it's uh rather early for you and uh first just to introduce myself i'm katie uh, with the Bones & Co. team, and we're excited to talk with Dr. Billinghurst today. Um, Dr. Billinghurst is a veterinary surgeon. He has over 40 years of experience uh, dealing every day with health problems in our companion animals. Uh, he's best known as one of the pioneers of feeding our dogs raw, uh, including raw bones, which is, of course, um, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk with you today. A uh, little bit of a shared interest there, you might say. Um, I know our team first connected with you a few years ago, so we're really excited to share this conversation again about how uh, raw diets can help our dogs live longer, uh, healthier lives. So uh, first things first, can you tell us about, do you have dogs? Do you have other companion animals? What does the animal landscape look like uh, at your home? Well, sadly, these days it's become quite limited because we we, we did live on acres several years ago. And of course, we had uh, chooks, which you call over in America chickens. We call them chooks here, but anyway, it's all right. We had uh, cows, we had cattle, we had goats. Um, I have had pigs in the past, but not for a long time. Um, and of course, we had dogs and cats. And uh, yeah, we're, but now we're down to one dog and one cat, both a bit like me, somewhat geriatric, both the pair of them. Um, but they have their father who lovingly prepares their food for them. And uh, we don't even buy the commercial stuff that I actually help produce. We just, but their names are kitty cat for the cat and honey for the dog. So when I say honey, I'm home, I'm not talking to my wife. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I also love kitty cat. Like just, just <laughs> keep it straightforward. Uh, and also, you have uh, on the Facebook Live, Terry Penny says, hi, from Canberra, Australia. So, Oh, uh, hi, Terry. Well, that's, that's not that. That's just up the road and up the hill a bit from where I am. Oh, uh, oh I love that. Australia's political capital. Uh, shocking place. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I have never been. Uh, someday would love to, though. It sounds like an amazing... Uh, best amazing country in the world. Uh, from my perspective. Yeah, you know what? That's 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 how you should feel about where you've chosen to spend your life. So I'm glad we heard Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yes. So can you just talk a little bit more, uh, you know, for people who might be listening who are not familiar with your work, tell us about your background and what you've spent, you know, really the majority of your life doing with companion animals. Oh, well, I had a very misspent youth studying instead of chasing other things. <laughs> I had a degree, I got a degree in agricultural science to start out with and became an agronomist with a strong interest in animal nutrition. So we studied animal nutrition of farm animals back then, not dogs and cats. Uh, from there, I went into, into, I became a potato agronomist, would you believe? It was actually potato and soybean. That was a year and it was a wasted year and I went straight into um, teaching from there because I was bonded to Australia's Department of Education. For, or to, to, anyway, <laughs> from there, I thought, oh, looking at all these kids I'm teaching, they're going off to university. I want to do what they're doing. I want to go. So by hook or by crook, because I was married and had a family at the time, but I managed to get another cadetship, I went and did veterinary science for another five years, which was the most, 
I'm going to use my best English. It was the bestest years of my study. It was absolutely brilliant. I just loved it. Um, anyway, um, so then I became a, a, I wanted to actually work with large animals, but it turned out I was colorblind. So when, when, when it came to putting the insemination straws in the cows, I couldn't tell whether this bull was George or Fred or whatever. And that was going to be a great trouble. So I said, oh, dear, I can't do this. That was really a very sad day in my life. Anyway, I went to small animal practice. And uh, the kind of the rest is history because I started looking at the diet of these animals and correlating it with their health. And it didn't make sense. The ones that were eating home-produced food based on raw meaty bones from the butcher, they were absurdly healthy. Hardly needed my attention just for spaying and or neutering or whatever. And uh, for, for health issues, they didn't have any. Anyway, that's, that's, so that's how I became interested in nutrition. So that's my academic background. Along the way, I also picked up a diploma in education from Armidale University. Um, I think that's about it. So um, I have this sort of disparate background of education and agriculture and veterinary science. Yeah, I mean, all all leads in the same direction, though. I, I didn't I didn't know that uh, specifically that you were colorblind and it uh, you know threw a wrench oh, in your that's plans. That's just one like, of many defects, Katie. Just one of many. <laughs> well, let's talk more specifically about raw feeding. I, again, I mentioned that you are you know one of the pioneers in introducing um, raw diet specifically for dogs, which of course is is where we're focused at Bones and Co. Um, so if you are describing the benefits of raw to someone for the very first time, somebody who's maybe fed kibble their whole lives to their pets because that's what they thought that they were supposed to do, where do you start? I start with cars. <laughs> yes, you, you tilted your head in just the right way. I say to them, you've got a Usually, you, you drive a car, don't you? And if you bought a brand new car, would you put in a generic or used spare parts or the wrong spare parts or the wrong fuel or the, or you, the wrong lubrication or lubrication that's been used before, say, the sump oil from another car? Would you do that? No. Why do you do it to your dog? Mm. It's all about design. Our dogs are designed by evolution to eat raw whole foods, particular foods that evolution designed. It didn't design them to eat grain that has been cooked to death, protein that has been cooked to death. And we wonder when we feed that stuff, actually the problem is vets don't wonder. They expect disease to turn up. So it's quite normal for them to see animals become sick on this awful food this politically correct food, which I call a poisoned chalice. So I explain to people, it's all about design. If you want your dog to be healthy, you eat the food that evolution designed for your dog. And also forget about worrying about nutrients. If you feed this food in the basic proportions that evolution said ought to happen, ought to be fed to your dog, then nutrients take care of themselves long as you're feeding that balance of food, that takes away all that stress that people put on themselves these days with spreadsheets and computers. I point out to them, how many dogs that you know in the wild have a computer and a spreadsheet? And you can see daddy dog comes in. He said, mom, I see you've eaten too much rabbit this morning. My God, you're, you're going to get a deficiency of what, what or what. It doesn't happen. I can't believe that people who feed no, themselves no, without a spreadsheet and without a computer then move on and say, but I have to have that for my dog. Of course you don't. You just understand, have to understand what foods they need, just as you understand, hopefully, most people, what foods they need. Stay away from these, this obsession with worrying about nutrients because we have a body and our dogs have a body that's been honed by millions, millions of years of evolution to take what nutrients it requires from real food. Now, even if AFCO or FEDF or NRC said that this piece of real food 
was deficient, general, as generally as if it's part of a balance of foods as prescribed by evolution, the body will take what it requires from that to the nth degree and it will survive. And it's got this beautiful redundancy where it stores things and, and it uses them. And it, as long as we're always feeding a wide variety of the foods that evolution prescribed, those nutrients just take care of themselves. There is no problem. It's been going on for millions of years. However, if you t take these nutritionally deficient foods, they don't have the foods. This, this stuff prescribed by AFCO or FEDIAF or whatever, they don't have the nutrients that evolution prescribed. They have what a group of experts, oh, what inverted commas, prescribe for their dogs for, or for our dogs. And it's not good enough. It is literally because you, and then they put these nutrients in the milieu of something that's been cooked and processed to the nth degree, ultra refined. The dog's body doesn't know what to do with that. Now, our dogs and cats' bodies are extremely resilient. They will last for a long time under these terrible conditions, but eventually they start to break down. Mm -hmm. And you see them break down earlier when they're fed these terribly politically correct or PC poison chalice foods, foods that sadly our veterinarians are trained to prescribe. And that's really sad. And one of my missions is to overcome that, but that's an, a lot of the thing. But so feed the food that evolution prescribes, that's all. That's what you have to do because that's what they, they are designed to do, just like your car is designed for specific parts and lubricants of fuel. It's so simple. It's a, it's a no-brainer. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate the, you know, the kind of confidence that you inspire because I, I see so, so often, I think we overcomplicate it. You know, you, you have on, unfortunately, the one end of the spectrum, lack of critical thought around what we're feeding our pets. And then on the other end is just this anxiety and this depth of complication um, that can, you know, you can, you can lose what's best for the dog in there as well. So I, uh, you know, something that we've, we've been talking a lot about with, um, you know, pet parents and, and people who maybe work in pet stores that sell our products is reminding, you know, pet parents, that if you, if you love to make these beautiful, complex, you know, meals for your dog, great. Like if you, if you love that and that works and that's something that you enjoy and your dog thrives on, wonderful. But there's a space in between not caring at all about I shouldn't say everybody cares about what they feed their dog, but not being critical about what you feed your dog. Uh, there's a space in between that, and, and we can all, um, you know, we can all do better with with fresh foods. But can, you hit can I some... jump in there, Katie? I just want to say something in relation to that. The people who absolutely use the computers and the spreadsheets because they're using real foods, the body doesn't care that they're using spreadsheets and computers. It takes For those foods anyways and uses what it requires and, and poops out the rest or piddles it out, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. All I'm here to do is say it's not absolutely necessary. Well, it's not necessary at all to go to those lengths. You can simply feed food. And that's why from the very beginning I said a child can do this if they understand what foods to feed. So anybody with no training in nutrition can do it. The, the most... The people who have the most difficulty with this style of raw feeding, where, where you just feed food, as evolution prescribed, are people with a PhD in nutrition because there are just so many mental roadblocks for mm. them. So I applaud any of those people who actually understand the truth about raw feeding because that's what we're talking about, the truth about it. Anyway, so I'll, I just want to intervene on that one because I'm not having you go in the sense that the people who use computers and spreadsheets are wrong in that because what they feed is doing the job anyway it doesn't really matter um but that that those all those computers and spreadsheets were absolutely unnecessary if they understood the principles the principles are what, what i'm all about so you you mentioned a little bit um you know that you've seen many vet professionals who have accepted disease as just normal part of the status quo of course, that's not uh, that's, that's something that we're here to we're here to change because it shouldn't be normal. You know, six million dogs in, the, in just in the U.S., six million dogs a year uh, diagnosed with cancer and metabolic diseases. Other than cancer, we could go we could we could spend a whole hour talking about that. But can you talk a little bit about um, how 
you have helped people, maybe they've worked with a vet in the past who hasn't been supportive of, you know, an evolutionarily appropriate nutritional approach, or they can't find the right vet. You know, what advice would you have for those, those people who are saying, I want to do the right thing. I'm just, I'm having trouble finding the right partner. You've just got to find a vet um, who is kind and who isn't judgmental. Because a lot of vets say, look, I don't understand this because I wasn't trained in it. Now, for some vets, that's a real problem because their ego gets in the way and they want to look like they're the authority. But if they can find a vet who's, who is um, willing to say, okay, I see you have a healthy animal and let's, if I can't really comment on what you're doing, but uh, hey, this, if what you're doing is producing this, keep doing it. That's the sort of vet you need. Um, you don't need somebody who's going to give you a hard time. So you've got to find a kind vet, somebody who is willing to ha to be non-judgmental because there aren't too many vets that truly understand this simple way of feeding because they've been trained to think that nutrients are all important, that they have to be at a very specific level. And they do in the poison chalice food, the politically correct, grain-based, cooked and ultra-refined food. They require the food to be at very precise levels in order not to cause an obvious problem. They still cause problems in the long term, but they don't cause any problems necessarily in the short term. So the, the problems they cause are rarely linked to them. But So find this really kind vet who mm. understands that there is more to nutrition than he perhaps or she understands. And, and that's really the best advice I can offer because... You're not going to find too many vets, even holistic vets don't fully understand. So many of them are still on the nutrition bandwagon where you need a spreadsheet and all those things. And, and they worry. And they worry about they worry about bugs, bones, and balance. They're the three things they worry about. And if you're feeding evolutionary style, all of those problems disappear. The bugs are actually part of the microbiome. They're our friends. The bones are also our friends, but you have to select the right ones. Uh, young bones from young animals. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that, I'm sure, because you, I know you want to ask me about that. And, and the balance issue is just a balance of foods. If you right, select the right foods, the nutrients take care of themselves. Like the nutrients we know about, the nutrients we don't know about, and the nutrients we are yet to s d decide are essential or important. They're all there because it's in the food. That's the way the dogs have eaten for millions of years. It is beyond simple. I, my mantra is nutrition is absurdly simple, but everybody wants to complicate it. But it helps so, to make money. So if you complicate we've, it. we've gotten, uh, get rid of your spreadsheets. Find a vet who is kind. I, I like this. This is great advice. Uh, we had a comment from Cindy Bristow, um, who, yes, she noted it is difficult to find those kind vets that will individualize each animal and owner, which you you and I started talking a little bit before about before uh, we went live. You said, what was it that you interrogate each animal that you? Oh, well, I interrogate the owner. The you interrogate the owner, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't leave until I've found the truth. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's what we want. So shifting just a little bit, uh, I, I want to talk about um, your book, Pointing the Bone at Cancer. Um, as you, you know, mentioned, uh, with Bones & Co., our, our start was because Ryan, um, our founder, unfortunately, his family lost a dog to cancer, and he started asking why. So I wanted to hear from you, you know, what motivated you to really dig into cancer from a nutritional perspective? Well, the first thing as a vet that I noticed was that uh, animals that ate that way rarely developed, well, ate real food. So we're talking about real food, evolution style food. They developed cancer. If they did it, it occurred later in life. And if it occurred even later in life, it was fairly, it was usually fairly non aggressive. So the question is, why is this so? Then I started, as I grew older, watching family members. This is terrible die a terrible death, being treated to death by the medical profession. And this included my 
my darling mother-in-law, um, your mother, she was a mother-in-law. I watched it, and then my some of my wife's cousins. Now they, they were smoking-related. It's true. I understood that. But I said there's, and I had also noticed over the years, of course, the dogs that lived in a smoking household often develop head and neck cancers. But that's by the by. I said there has to be a reason. So what motivated me was I I, I didn't know how to help these human beings. So I had to know more about what cancer was. So I actually spent, it was over 10 years. In fact, it was, I'd been studying it for 10 years and writing stuff about it in my computer. And on the 3rd of August, 2016, my wife said to me, I'm going to give you three months to finish that book. And of course, I'm going to organize a speaking tour around Australia to talk about it. So under that motivation, I actually finished the book. It has got yeah, quite a few <laughs> and we got it done so uh, and so that was 2016 and um, what I discovered was that cancer is not exactly what we think it is today and there's a lot of people that know this uh, a fellow called Safe Reads and a whole host of others Paul Davies but it's it's not generally accepted that cancer does not begin with a series of mutations in most instances. It begins with a failing mitochondria, which turns on a process of energy production called glycolysis. And that is a signal for the body to begin going into reproductive mode and to de-differentiate, to go, stop being, if it's, a, if it's a liver cell, stop being a liver cell. And it, it actually, this happens with the stem cells in each of the tissues. And so this is where it begins. And it's a return to, they call it at at atavism, a return to a old method of, of behaving. And it's a method of behaving that our ancestors as single celled organisms, three billion years ago, they were immortal. All they did was just divide in half, keep going. When we became multicellular, we became mortal and we are cancer is a return to immortality and we know that but it's a return to the sort of and, and we can see this in early embryonic growth and once just after fertilization the blastocyst or more, whatever that little organism we want to call it when it's dividing rapidly which it does 2 4 8 16 32 64 and so on it's using glycolysis because that's that sends a signal to the nuclear genome that we have to just multiply rapidly, rapidly, rapidly glycolysis. So when the mitochondria, and this is a, it's damaged, and the mitochondria carries out energy according to oxidase phosphorylation, when that's damaged by long-term exposure to carcinogens, then that this cell goes into multiple rounds of reproduction. Then we start to get a loss of control of repair processes to genes, and that's where the mutations come in. But the mutations are secondary and down the road. So we need to look at cancer very much as a metabolic disease. And for example, if an animal has a PET scan, now I'll just go back a step. As a metabolic disease, it feeds on sugar because glycolysis, this process that stimulates the cell to go into reproductive mode, this form of energy production, feeds specifically on sugar. The mitochondria take fats with proteins and sugar and produce energy. But if they're damaged, we go into glycolysis. It's a, and it's got to be a slow damage. If it's a quick damage, the, the cell simply dies. If it's a slow damage, it gradually turns over to this alternative energy formation, form of producing energy and stimulates or tells the nuclear genome we have to go into reproductive mode and that's where the cancer starts and then you lose loss a whole loss of other stuff because you go back to this primitive way of behaving but it's a it's a turn on of a, of a program that is already there and then when once we start to lose the ability to repair genes because every time a cell reproduces itself there is always a miscopying and that needs to be repaired those repair processes are turned off because they're not required by these cells anymore, uh, if, without going into a whole heaps of details. But what we have here is a situation where, because it's undergoing glycolysis, it only feeds on sugar. 
So if we could somehow take away that sugar, we can actually starve the cancer. And the way to know that your cancer is a sugar feeder, is if, it's, if it's diagnosed with a PET scan, which, use radio, which uses radio labeled sugar to um, detect the cancer, then we know it's a sugar eater. And these cells, these cancer cells, they're absolutely bristling with insulin receptors because they take in the sugar. They're so hungry for it. And they force the body to turn all its protein into sugar. And so we get this cancer cachexia where there's loss of muscle mass going on. It's, it's, so we have this situation where this, this growth that is actually part of us is now set free. It wants to become immortal and it acts like a parasite on the body and it destroys the body. It's, it's an awful situation. And I, so my answer to people when they say, what do, what do I do? I said, well, look, whatever else you're doing, feed a diet that is going to restrict that sugar. And this comes down to feed it. Well, feed, it, feed the evolutionary diet as a base because that's the most healthy diet. It's going to stimulate the immune system. And then gradually try and shift it to a more ketogenic focus. And the way to do that, well, A, you've cut out the carbs in the diet. So it's a, basically a fat and protein. And um, carbohydrate as fiber yes but not but not as sugars or starch because the fiber is important for feeding the, the the microbiome but if you gradually cut down the protein to just what the animal needs to maintain its body organ mass and everything else the, the skin and the brain everything else but you increase the fat gradually you do it gradually because usually there's time once the diagnosis is made unless the the dog is in severe straits, but if, if this time you gradually and keep your dog, and you can even start to measure ketones and blood sugar, but keep but gradually increase and and get your dog if you can into ketosis. Now for humans, the, the figure comes up to about four, I think it's millimoles or whatever per liter or whatever. For the dogs, you rarely get above one because dogs tend to use it up. They they they're very used to using ketones, so they tend to use it up more quickly than humans. But that's, that's my advice to people. And I think you, you have a, a lady who's got a dog with a mouth tumour, and I don't know what that mouth tumour is. I mean, it could be as simple as an epulis on the gums, but it may be something like a, some awful sarcoma or, or whatever. But whatever treatment you're doing, augment it with the evolutionary diet that you are gradually transforming into a ketogenic version of the evolutionary diet. And this is the way I help people who come to me with um, consultations with dogs with cancer. We, it, the evolutionary diet fixes most problems by itself because most problems arise from feeding this terrible food. So it's almost like a universal panacea and people say there's no such thing. Well, if you have a universal problem and there's a you take away that problem and put the right thing there that doesn't cause those problems. Yes, that's what you end up with. You end up with what appears to be a universal panacea. So whatever else they're doing, uh, whether it's radiation, it's chemo, sur surgery, whatever, or whatever other alternative modalities, make sure you get the diet right. Evolutionary nutrition with a gradual changeover to a ketogenic variant. It's a really helpful, helpful explanation. We talk about uh, we talk about glycolysis and ketosis quite a bit, of course, at Bones and Co. But uh, that explanation goes a little bit deeper than um, you know, deeper than we can typically go. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, expanding on that a little bit, um, can you offer a little bit of advice from the standpoint of? dogs that may be struggling with inflammation. Um, we had uh, one person reach out saying that she unfortunately has a dog who just really struggles with um, inflammation in their ear. Uh, can you talk a little bit about diet and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, maybe you have a dog that doesn't have <laughs> cancer or maybe hopefully won't uh, receive that diagnosis, but uh, how can diet and specifically a raw diet help with those inflammatory conditions? Well, Inflammation, <clears throat> excuse me, is caused by principally in any modern human being or dog or cat by a high carbohydrate diet. 
it drives inflammation um, in two ways. One, the sugar itself, and secondly, by raising insulin. And insulin drives inflammation. And it does it in a number of ways. Um, most importantly, insulin pushes these um, transient hormones called eicosanoids, prostaglandins, down the inflammatory path. And omega-6 does the same thing. It pushes them down the inflammatory path. But omega-6 will push them down the anti-inflammatory path if we increase omega-3s. So omega-3s are key, not because they in themselves are so heavily anti-inflammatory, which they are, but only very mildly. The true anti-inflammation um, fat is the omega-6. And I liken it to this way. The omega-6 is like a silly husband who only does what his wife says. Well, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a sensible husband. So the omega-3 is like the, the nagging wife who pushes the omega-6 to produce anti-inflammatory eicosanoids. And that's why we need to really, in modern diets, which are very high in omega-6, push the omega-3s. So if there's high levels of omega-3s, which is basically fish oil or krill oil, and those sort of things, it tells the omega-6 to produce anti-inflammatory eicosanoids. And that's exactly what we want. So if we stop if we stop the sugar, which stops insulin anyway, and feed just the basic evolutionary diet and go ahead towards a more ketogenic version, um, high in omega threes, plus the other fats of course, healthy animal fats as well. And let me stress that animal fats that are raw are, are healthy, including the, the saturated fats. There's if you look at the brain, it's mostly saturated fats, but it's also got a lot of uh, unsaturated fats, but the everybody's afraid of saturated fats, but that's been an absolute furphy. Uh, it's not true, and they all changed to something with high sugar and wondered why they got sick. So, evolutionary diet is the simple answer, and so Bones and Co is producing that. Um, as an, I'm so pleased to say, so many places are these days, um, and so it's going to drop the sugar drop the insulin, and then add in the omega-3s. And then you could add, add you know, things like turmeric and bromelain and a whole host of other herbs that also help. But the base thing is cut out the sugar, have an evolutionary-style diet, add omega-3s, and that's, they, they're your principal things to do. One thing you mentioned I want to touch on a little bit more is around the, you mentioned the benefits of the raw fats. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the nutritional benefit of a raw diet versus a you know, maybe gently cooked diet. We get asked, uh, actually fairly frequently people asking us, can they cook our patties for their dogs? And, you know, we, we uh, always give them some other options to try, maybe adding a little warm water with the patty, adding some goat milk. Uh, but can you speak to that a little bit about what are what is the dog losing? Uh, when you go from, from raw to gently, or I'm putting words in your mouth, is the dog losing anything when they go from raw to gently cooked? Okay, so you buy a lovely brand new spare part, well, I don't know, carburetor for your car, because your car needs a new one. Before you put it in, you take it out and you bash it a bit. Then you put it in. Would you do that? No. Evolution did not prescribe cooked food. So it's not, it's that simple. I mean, cooking or lightly cooking it destroys the microbiome you're trying to put in there, which is, and let me stress, your body needs to have a little bit of compilobacter, a little bit of E. coli, a little bit of salmonella, a little bit of all sorts of bugs because the immune system has to meet these. Oh, hello, nice to know you. Look, I'd like you to stay in that little compartment there. And if you behave yourself, I won't get in and get stridently and kill you. And I have all these other little bugs here, these healthy bugs, that are just going to make sure you stay in that little compartment. But, I, but once I know you're there, I, I have developed all the armaments to destroy you should you become a naughty salmonella or a naughty E. coli. And it's called the immune system and it's called IgM and 
IgE and all, all these immunoglobulins and memory of you. I remember you. Oh, yes, I know you. If you start to spring up, I'm going to bring out my heavy armament and, and I will attack you. But if you stay there, that's fine. And, and being there reminds me that I must always keep a stock of armaments ready to attack you. So it's important not even to lightly cook. That look, some, I've had people tell me my dog will not eat raw food. I don't care. Then their dog becomes sick and they come back. Oh, what was that you said I should feed? Oh, yes. Suddenly it has to now eat raw food. It's the owner, not the dog. That's the problem. Or well, that's the issue. And we're all human and we all have these human frailties. And I understand for somebody who only eats vegetables, the handling of raw meat oh, is, 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 is repulsive. I understand that. But somehow we have to under, also understand as dog lovers that we perhaps do have to feed them according to how evolution prescribed, if we want them to be supremely healthy. There are very few situations where I would prescribe cooked food. Very few. Warm it? Yeah. Get it so that it's just freshly killed, brimming with blood and all that nasty stuff. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to include that in the response next time. Well, I am so appreciative of your time today, um, and we will add in the uh, discussion uh, for this event. We'll add links to your website, to your books. Uh, but again, we we just appreciate your time and sharing your expertise uh, with us, and hope to do it again soon. Okay, well, it would be lovely. It's been nice talking to you, and um, yeah. Bye.